children were little, we used to drive past Pentonville Prison once or twice a week on our way to meet friends at the park or the zoo. Yeah. Oh, can't hear. Or I start again. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. All right. When my children were little, we used to drive past Pentonville Prison once or twice a week on our way to meet friends at the park or the zoo, the nursery rhyme tape blaring in the cassette machine and the children cocooned in their car seats, both of them having their childhood, how it was supposed to be lived, me protecting them from harm and doing my best to look after them properly. On the pavement opposite the prison one time, I saw a young woman hold up a baby so that her husband or boyfriend behind bars in one of the upper windows could see his child over the top of the high wall and wave at her. The woman's arms were strong. She raised the baby above her head to show the child's father how big she was getting, how beautifully she was turned out in spite of everything. I found myself thinking about the arrangement they might have made so, so that he was ready at the window of his cell right after the baby had been fed and changed. The unpredictable timing of it. Or was he just standing there all day, waiting on the off chance to catch a glimpse of his loved ones? Perhaps that little family was all he had left. I was moved by the young mother's optimism, her generosity, but felt sad and angry every time I drove past those prison walls <coughs> because my brother was in there serving a two-year sentence for what I used to tell everybody was bank robbery. I never went to visit him. It must have been shame that led me to change the details of the story, if I was ever really clear about it in the first place. What had he done? I don't suppose he burst into the bank with a gun like in the films, terrifying the poor counter clerk, a balaclava over his head, or his face hidden behind one of those tan-coloured stockings that flatten and distort the features the money or your life. No, I don't think the actual facts, no, I think the actual facts were for me more shameful. Was it a white collar crime or a blue collar crime, a behind the scenes fraud so inept he was collared? Or did he go into a bank with a stolen checkbook and attempt to withdraw money that didn't belong to him, pushed out in front by his partners in crime because he was foolhardy, the most desperate? I don't know, I've forgotten the details but the endless misery and humiliation of his drug taking and the shame of getting caught, if he could even feel shame, were, were all less painful for me in the distorted version. I don't think I ever really told anybody he perpetrated an armed robbery, but in the violence of that imagined story, I was protecting myself or distracting myself from the abject nature of his victimhood, all the shame attendant on his very public hurt his pain and the ostentatious wounds he was inflicting on himself. Incidentally, and this, this has nothing much to do with shame, after his re release from Pentonville, when he was in temporary accommodation arranged for him by the probation service, he found an almost untouched hamburger in a bin in the street outside King's Cross Station. Not very hungry at the time and hoping to warm it up a bit, he stashed the burger behind the radiator in his room and forgot about it. Two weeks later, drawn by the smell of cooked meat, he found it again and devoured it. No harm came to him. One of the gleeful stories he used to tell about himself. Shame hurts the victim as much, if not more, than the perpetrator. Unlike guilt, which can teach the perpetrator to mend his ways, shame, for me, has no useful function. It's a physical sensation as well as an emotion, a rise in temperature, a flush, blush, gut feeling, sweat, slump, cringe, or caving in of the body over the genitals. We've all dreamt of forgetting to put our knickers on, wandering out of the bedroom into a public place, only to become aware that our ass is hanging out and we wish to die of shame. To die, death might feel more welcome. What if we wet ourselves and people laughed or sold ourselves? Could death be worse than that? My beloved mother, the heroic parent of five illegitimate children, bought a bag of old football socks from a stall in Chapel Market when you could still buy second-hand clothes from a barrow by the corner of White Conduit Street. That's all gone now. 
This was at a time when the girls in our neighborhood were wearing white knee socks, plain, ribbed, or lacy knit, not a look I aspired to, but still. As we traipsed through the streets on our way to school the morning after my mum's bargain find, I saw that they were all, we, we were all wearing the new socks. Mine were the worst, yellow ochre with two purple stripes at the top, and my brothers and sisters all had versions of the same. The red and white, white weren't so bad as they were the arsenal, but the others were all terrible. What shame I felt then, what bravado. I would have to fight off the bullies and the piss takers when we got to school, not just on my own behalf, but for the whole of my family. To save face, I would have to make out, if only to myself, that the girls in white socks were all the stupid people in this situation, not me. I drew blood in the playground, not my own, and got sent to the headmistress for defending myself. She wagged her finger. Girls were not allowed to fight, not allowed to play football, not even allowed to wear trousers. Not that I was wearing trousers on that occasion, but I had been in trouble for wearing trousers before. In my class, there was a black child called Paul who used to fold himself up and hide in the brown cupboard. One long, af one long afternoon during sums, the teacher dragged Paul out of his hiding place, lifted him, lifted him up above his head and let him fall. Paul crashed to the floor and lay there, inert in his little shorts and hand-knitted pullover, eyes closed and mouth open. Was he dead? At least he didn't wet himself. The teacher prodded him gently with the toe of his shoe and warned him not to snivel. We were told to sit down and shut up. Paul's eyes opened at last and he began to sob disobediently in the silent classroom because he couldn't help himself. And the teacher sat at his, sat at his desk on the podium by the door and pared his fingernails. Everybody was fidgeting uneasily but nobody dared to say anything, not even me. In the end, Paul got up and returned to his chair at the back of the room tugging down the front of his pullover and wiping his nose on the back of his hand. The lesson began again as if nothing had happened. I inhabited Paul's shame and the shame of the teacher, whose name was Mr. Dean, now I'm pointing the finger. He was a racist and we, his class, were complicit in his behavior because we didn't rise up against him. In our weekly art lesson, he only permitted the use of three colors, red, blue, and yellow, following an Australian theory of painting that confused me in its simplicity. We were not allowed to mix colors. Purple and orange were banned. Even green was forbidden, a color that seemed so essential, so innocent. Not long after the assault on Paul, we emigrated to Trinidad. I remember my mum's boyfriend interviewing sailors for jobs on board the leaky sailing ship. He was captaining round the islands of the Caribbean the hold laden with cargoes of quicklime and other dangerous substances. The men lined up at the harbour's edge, each candidate required to tie a reef knot and answer a few nautical questions. My mum's boyfriend was six foot four, blonde, German, and all the men in the queue were black, desperate for work, gangly and too eager, sullen and yet willi wishing to please the white master. One by one, the men stepped forward and failed to give the correct answer or tie the correct knot. One by one, the captain pushed them over the side into the filthy water and jeered at them as they flailed among the chains and ropes and greasy hulls of the tethered boats. They were not swimmers. What did that teach me? The shame was not felt where it should have been felt. I wanted the men to overthrow the captain or at least take him down as they went down in the water to grab and snatch him off the side of the harbor where he stood in his captain's hat and attempted to justify himself to me as they went down. He called the men liars and cheats. One by one, they hauled themselves out of the water and dispersed, still unemployed, still hungry, bruised, cowed and dripping, and not one of them even shouted back at him, as if the captain's behavior towards them was no more than they deserved, or they were so used to it they hardly noticed they were being treated how their ancestors were treated, like slaves. But he loved me, and his affection shamed me because I knew it was sexual. He fancied me and I had to watch myself all the time. I didn't deserve to be spanked. Nobody asked me if I wanted to see his erect penis or to sit on his lap. I still feel shame now if somebody comes on to me and I don't feel the same way. Back home again, the last year of primary school, Maxine Webster was wearing a bra under her shiny white turtleneck and talk of her bust was all around the playground. She was so proud of it. She threw a leaving party 
and invited all the tall or well-developed children in our class, whether or not she was friends with them. I was tall and glad to be asked, but went to the party expecting to eat jelly and crisps and play party games. When I got there, all the lights were off in her front room, the curtains were closed, her parents were out, Titan Up was playing on the record player, and all the girls had paired off with boys and were snogging and being groped. I sat on a chair at the edge of the room for a few minutes, watching the couple stumbling around in the dark. Then I, ra then I ran home and cried. There wasn't even any food. My mother told me I would never get married unless I toned myself down a bit, which meant I was too fat and too opinionated. On the first day at secondary school, we were told to fill in a form about ourselves and our families. The teacher made me stand up in class to explain myself. Why did I say I had two parents with two different surnames who didn't even live at the same address? What did I mean by that? I explained that they were not married and there was a sort of shocked silence. I felt no shame then as I felt none about our poverty. I was proud of myself, a feeling that didn't go very deep but propelled me forwards. I worked diligently for the first two and a half years, filling the lovely blank exercise books with my neat handwriting and painstaking illustrations. But as I grew up, I came to hate and despise most of the other girls in the school who were quite nice but seemed childlike, too bland, untroubled. I still believed I was conscientious and sensible, but looking back, that was only correct in context. I only liked one girl, Darlajit Jane Gilroy, who was even more badly behaved than me. The captain reappeared when I was 14 and couldn't leave me alone. My mother blamed me for provoking him sexually. I made her choose him or me. She blamed me, but she chose me. She thre he threw himself in the Thames, but was rescued by the river police. She said I was cold and heartless because I didn't care if he wanted to drown himself. I was numb, bored with all the drama. He went back to Germany, married a psychoanalyst, then ran off with her teenage daughter, which made me feel vindicated. <laughs> Something else happened to me that shouldn't have happened. When I was 14, I got raped in my own bed by one of my brother's friends. I didn't call it rape even to myself back then because I was unable to scream or fight back. I tried to defend myself and then I gave up. My limbs were too heavy, paralyzed as in a nightmare when you try to shout but nothing comes out of your mouth. I was too out of it and he was too strong for me. I didn't tell, en tell anybody like there was nothing to tell. Only since the death of my mother have I been able to name it. Not long afterwards, I fell in love with another one of my brother's friends and left home. When she used to tell my children I was the teenager from hell, my mother was distorting facts to cover her own shame. On top of everything else, she must have felt <coughs> guilt for her part in my upbringing, conscious or unconscious. Hard for her to manage either way, but the shame was deeper and more corrosive. When she was diagnosed with cancer in her 70s, we came to an agreement she was not allowed to mention the captain unless she was prepared to be honest about his behaviour. This was a practical arrangement. She understood that now we were to spend a fair bit of time together on a regular basis as part of her care. She would have to resist the temptation to tell me stories of his daring do at sea or any of that inflammatory whitewash. That was the last time she spoke of him. As an adult, I have become aware of my own shame, just not, not just about the sex, which of which I was an innocent victim, and the bad choices I made as a result that still make me cringe and will remain secret, but the poverty and the illegitimacy. I used to feel that sociologists were wrong to put emphasis on these social ills. What did it matter if you lived in a shitty bedsit and smoked dog ends? But it does matter. Over the banisters at 95 Graham Road, where I lived for a while on my own in a small room at the back that was so cold I spent most of my time in bed, and you had to wash your dirty dishes in the shared bath in the basement. I heard the couple upstairs talking about me. She was a middle-aged woman with a big bust in a floral dress, and he was younger and dyed his hair auburn. The woman, not realizing I was in the hall, <coughs> said, that girl downstairs like a frightened rabbit. I realized she was talking about me, doing me down for her own reasons. I didn't know that people knew I was frightened. I was vulnerable to the point of illness, and felt extra shame then to be judged like that. But the shame didn't help me to change my life for the better. I was even more nervous, having been subjected to her judgment, and continued to live without protection 
in that dangerous house, in that dangerous street, in that dangerous neighborhood, not far from the German hospital where the mad people stood at the barred windows and screamed. It was only once I found somewhere warm to live in a safer neighborhood amongst friends I began to feel better. In hindsight, the shame of illegitimacy for me was not the shame of unmarried parents in the eye of society. It was the half grasped sense that my father was unable to concentrate on my mother or his children for long enough to keep us safe and look after us properly. <coughs> that made me feel unlovable. My mother was humiliated. Her distress and the muddle of our circumstances caused me anxiety. Children need to know that there will be enough food and that ele the electricity will not be cut off. People look down on you when you are poor and illegitimate, illegitimate, which isn't news. They feel sorry for you, which is unbearable. In the punk days, I was glad suddenly that nobody cared if the ass was out of your trousers. The worse, the better. I remember the joy of release from my concern not to look too poor, too disheveled and masculine, too mad even. The white specks and shine on my dark jacket no longer made me feel I was falling apart. Women and girls were no longer required to tone themselves down and you could do what you liked. You didn't have to try to be neat or feminine. I took photographs, read and worked four days a week in a cafe to keep my head above water. Many of my young women friends were having sex for money just to live, to buy alcohol and drugs. We might have appeared shameless in our behavior, full of youthful exuberance, wild and rebellious, flaunting ourselves. But looking back, it was all about shame we all felt unlovable. We'd not been protected as children and had, not, and had not been taught by our mothers how to look after ourselves properly because none of our mothers were in possession of the wherewithal to give us the proper lessons. But at least we had each other, which was not nothing and meant, meant a lot to me at the time. My thanks to Debbie, Dominie, Tracy, Katie, Polly, all dead now. My brother tells another story of his drug taking. He bought some heroin and knowing he would take it all and have none left for the next day, he split the bag in half and posted one half to himself, first class. The postman would deliver it in the morning, <coughs> just in time for his first hit. Such confidence in the Royal Mail. <laughs> Having injected the remainder of the drugs, he spent the rest of the day on the corner of his street trying to fish his envelope out of the post box with a bent coat hanger, <laughs> amongst other improvised implements before the postman jumped out of his van, opened the hinged door under the little slot and put my brother out of his misery. There is no shame attached to this story the way he tells it. He can bear himself in this anecdote as I can bear him and myself in mine. Some of the other stories are too shameful even to put into words right now. to revert uh, back to more academic mode now and pick up on what Rose, uh, some of the aspects that Rose so eloquently <coughs> spoke to in her piece, uh, particularly the aspect of what she talked about in her experience of shame having no useful function, shame as a profoundly devastating feeling of being unlovable. Uh, I want to talk, I'm going to talk very much from my perspective as an academic and the research I've done into German literature and culture. Um, and the emphasis in much of more recent theory, in theory of the last 20, 30 years, which I'm going to call recent for the purposes of today, on shame as uh, an emotion uh, that has been has become valorized as positive in various different ways. In terms of sociological or historical definitions, I'm thinking here of the sociologist Norbert Elias, for example. Shame is fundamental to the social regulation of the individual, uh, as Akosha has said, as a means to police and reinforce moral codes and values, and that is perhaps how most of us are most immediately exposed to shame in our own lives. Um, shame has perhaps been, oh, and th this works both ways, and the example I want to give, often this policing function is seen to be very negative, but one example that perhaps we'd all immediately uh, assume or accept unquestioningly is when Primo Levi re uh, referred to the Germans as having no shame. 
by which, of course, he implied immediately that they had no morality. So this is a type of emphasis on value or a policing using shame that comes from the other way and we therefore wouldn't immediately question his use of the word. In psychoanalytic and philosophical discourse, as we've already heard, um, the development of shame is made more complex or is thought about in a more complex way, not least because of the notion of introjection where uh, through the development of the subject, social values and norms are not simply taken uh, on board in the development of the subject in any straightforward way, but can be uh, transformed in the way they form the subject. Shame here, as understood in psychoanalytic and many philosophical traditions, becomes an emotion of self. And I found it very interesting how you also referred to pride here, Pride is often also seen as an emotion of the self, as is embarrassment. Um, all in different ways point us very intensely to a focus on the immediacy of ourselves in the present. So shame is described in these discourses as leading to or as, as being a shattering of the ego, an extreme pain, the extreme pain of worthlessness an undermining of the sense of self. However, and this is where I'm going to hope resort to PowerPoint. Um, uh, is there anyone here who knows what they're doing, unlike me? Okay, this is, this, is, this is just to give you some quotations. This notion of the sense of self um, of being shattered is seen by many theorists as revealing the truth of the subject um, as split. Uh, so that devastating feeling of worthlessness is actually the truth of what it means to be human. And this therefore becomes valorized as a location, as a site of the ethical. Um, I was going to give you some quotations here, if we can get it up, um, just to give you examples of that. Well, while we're waiting for them to come up, I'll perhaps talk about um, or draw parallels with the way in which trauma has been theorized. Trauma, too, has, in what is uh, often referred to as the ethical turn, been seen as something... Uh, if, if I say positive, that's perhaps not the right word, but has been valorized as well as a, as a site of ethical value. Um, and trauma is often spoken of in the literature as a very similar way as shame is in terms of its effect on the self. And um, uh, uh, both shame and trauma, or the evidence of shame and trauma, are seen as a sign of an individual's humanity. Both result in the shattering of the ego. Uh, both bring with them the pain of feeling <coughs> worthless. Both very importantly, but for, for me as someone who works on narrative representation, both uh, result in the rupture of the narrative of self, a breakdown of the symbolic and affective functioning. Um, are, are we... Okay. Okay, we're nearly there. Before I move on to the um, to the next bit, you need to grab the technician. Okay. Um, well, we'll come back to that if possible. Um, A counter-argument, perhaps, perhaps, no, the thing is, if I look through my papers to find the quotations, they, uh, it, it might take too long. Anyway, we'll see if we can come back to that. Um, what I want to do now is to um, suggest that we need to be much more critical of this, uh, uh, of this trend in uh, a, a lot of psychoanalytic criticism, a lot of a certain strands of philosophy in uh, seeing the ethical potential of shame because it seems to me that this tendency seems to overlook precisely the damaging, um, uh, uh, the profoundly damaging effect that shame has on the self. And there's one very interesting theorist who's written both on shame and indeed on trauma, 
who talks about, uh, or who has responded quite powerfully to these trends, pointing out, and I quote here, she asks, this is Ruth Lees, how can there be an argument about the meaning of an emotional situation if the issue for us is simply how we feel? How can we say that it is ethical simply to feel shame rather than contextualize shame and see how it fits in with a wider social and historical situation? Whereby I don't want to suggest, as many of historians of emotion do when they work on shame, that shame is, uh, I would say, simply historically contingent and constructed, which is what historians often uh, put forward about emotion. I think, very, uh, I think there is no doubt that shame is one of the fundamental affects and is in that sense trans-historical, even if it's manifestation in terms of the social values and norms that it is related to are then historically contingent and vary, as is evident when we look at different types of shaming culture um, uh, for, from locality to locality. Um, so focusing on the affect and the pure shame, uh, if, if we do that, it shifts ethics into an idealized realm which is removed from the murky reality of action and interaction with another. Um, if, if we think of shame as an ethical site uh, divorced from a situation, then it loses the complexity of interhuman uh, interaction, which precisely for me is the realm of the ethical. I want to give uh, perhaps four, and these, this is, this is four, four aspects of um, shame that I would argue uh, emphasize it, its amorality. It is as an affect, a very negative affect in my view, but its functioning in that sense is amoral. And I'll tell you why I think that. First of all, per perhaps, um, I, I, I mean, by, I, what I mean by amoral is that, it, that, that, it, that we must resist this notion of it being ethical in any way. First of all, I would suggest that shame accompanies transgression. So if we think of shame as having a policing function, shame accompanies transgression. It doesn't necessarily alter or prevent it in any way. Um, so, in terms of its policing function, it signally fails uh, in most examples that we can think of. Secondly, um, there are frequent examples of feeling, uh, people feeling shame who shouldn't. This is very uh, evident in my work on uh, perpetration in the German context. It's very often the perpetrators of um, collective violence, and as we know, perpetrators of sexual violence do not, are, are the ones who frequently do not feel shame. They frequently don't feel guilt, but that's a slight, slightly different issue. They don't feel shame. It is their victims who carry a burden of shame. So again, uh, difficult to see how this, uh, you know, this is another reason why I'm not very happy with the notion of it being ethical. Uh, People feel shame, as it were, about the wrong thing. Um, I don't know if any of you have either read the book The Reader uh, by Bernard Schlink or seen the film, but what drives the behavior of, it's Hannah, isn't it? Is it Hannah, the woman's name? Um, what drives her behavior is, not, is shame over uh, not being able to read or write. And, uh, you know, a shame that for us in the post-Holocaust context which uh, is trivial compared to the actions that she's then involved with, is for her and her profound feeling of shame what drives her into doing what, on the, what, what under most you know, moral um, definitions is a much more e evil uh, way to behave. So this very bizarre thing that we're faced with, uh, with shame, that often we feel shame about things that are not obvious or not the ob more obvious thing that we might be expected to feel shame about. I would go even further though and say that shame often facilitates abuse. Or perhaps I should say the fear of shame facilitates abuse. 
the shame is such a profoundly negative feeling. It's a feeling that we will actually go a long way in order to avoid. And what I'm thinking here then is the importance of shame avoidance in the formation of very powerful peer pressure dynamics. And this is where, again, in the German context, one of the reasons, by no means the only one, but a very significant bonding mechanism for the Einsatzgruppen, who were the groups of often, you know, drafted policemen who on the eastern, behind the eastern front or often ahead of the eastern front, went in and uh, were responsible for the mass killings of Jews. Um, it was the peer pressure and the fear of, I would see it as a fear of the shame that comes from not being accepted by that peer group, which I think fits very importantly with um, Akosha's paper earlier about the importance of feeling recognized. This can have a very negative effect in, depending on what that peer pressure is and in relation to what group. The shame itself is neutral, but the fear of the shame, uh, uh, you know, it is not, it, shame doesn't lead to positive outcomes. Shame or the fear of shame can lead to uh, a situation where perpetrating violence and shooting someone straightforwardly is actually a better option than refusing to do so. Um, so finally, and this is perhaps, uh, if I, I, can't, I can't remember, I think you asked the question about methodology. You know, I, I'm, I'm a literary scholar. I, 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 I'm not a psychoanalyst, I'm not a psychologist, so I can't answer any uh, questions should they arise on, you know, the very interesting questions on, uh, on shame in that sense. But what in my work I think has been particularly interesting, and this is where the question about methodology comes up, is the notion of shamelessness that for me, perhaps, a response to shame and resisting shame, resisting falling into the trap of shame as a form of continuing the judgment, continuing the habits of morality that are linked with shame, which I think are very easily to, easy to slip into. I think it's very easy to, even when we're faced with perpetrators, uh, of sexual violence or whatever, to want them to feel shame. I mean, there we are slipping into precisely the shame discourse that I am suggesting is unhelpful and negative. And this, I think, is where the notion of shamelessness is perhaps important, by which I don't mean the development of shame into pride. I think pride as an emotion of the self brings with it the dangers of the other emotions of self, like shame, like embarrassment, but a notion of shamelessness that certainly in terms of literary or filmic representation mean the withholding of morality, of judgments, of modes of passing judgment, but rather a mode of representation that confronts us with our own, um, what our own structures of morality so I'm thinking I mean the, 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 the uh, for example I don't know how many of you know Manet's Olympia where she is simply gazing out at the viewer shamelessly now I, I wouldn't say necessarily with pride but that shameless gaze is one that actually exposes the, the double standard of the conventional male viewer who is expected to, you know, have a benevolent gaze upon him when looking at a nude, that sort of unjudging gaze, but that nevertheless confronts us with our own structures, the structures of morality within which we find ourselves. Fassbinder is another very interesting director um, who I think works quite interestingly with a shamelessness in his filmic technique of confronting us with um, ludicrous situations um, which actually counterbalance the suffering that he's often interested in portraying, uh, but that actually then again expose the moral structures or the shaming structures, although uh, I agree with Akosha that it's shame and shaming are different. But methodologically there, I think for me, working with representation, somehow that notion of shamelessness becomes uh, has, has been interesting.
And that, that's really... Uh, oh, no, here, here we have the vital quotes that were missing. These, these are the quotes by various... Jo Kopchek is um, as a feminist Lacanian critic, and she talks about here... Um, by seeing oneself through the other, one apprehends oneself in the categories of the culture to which one belongs or of someone one wishes to please, with the result that one therefore, thereby regards oneself as a known or knowable object. So that notion of the centrality of shame, here we have Levinas, um, French philosopher. The, uh, is this? No, that's in the right order. I didn't want to come here. Here are some, here are some much more typical examples of where shame is being lionised. So Kopchek goes on, to experience shame is to experience oneself not as a despised or degraded object, but to experience oneself as a subject. I am not ashamed of myself, I am the shame I feel. And then Agamben, shame is the fundamental sentiment of being a subject. Uh, Kosofsky Sedgwick, shame attaches to and sharpens the sense of who one is. One is something in experiencing shame. And finally, Donald uh, Nathanson, what is exposed in the moment of shame is something deeply personal, something particularly intimate, sensitive and vulnerable aspect of the self. Shame monitors our sense of self. Now, perhaps nothing in there is intrinsically problematic, except that this emphasis on the self as the site, you know, as this, that the, 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 the self is really, the, the moment of truth of the self is located in the shattering of the ego. Uh, that I consider a limitation to how we, how we must think of shame as, as, as being negative. But, yeah. Thank you. Um, um, <laughs> yeah, we, um, uh, Peter. Uh, I'm just wondering, I mean, responding to your final point there, I mean, isn't there a difference between, this is all, right? No. Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, just responding to your final point. I mean, isn't isn't there a little bit of a distinction between um, shame as a negative phenomenon between two people, and the idea of? I mean, I think a lot of people when you talk about shame in sort of these ways, it's, it's actually about confronting shame, right? So I mean, I, I'm just wondering if there's not a distinction to be drawn between shame as something negative and a kind of confrontation with shame as potentially implicated in these attempts to, to view it in a positive sense. Does that make any sense or am I just off? Uh, no, it, no it, it, it does make sense. I think, I think the problem for me is the emphasis on, and, and this is where there is a strong parallel with um, a lot of recent trauma theory, the emphasis on the shattered self as giving or as being the starting point or being the site, the ethical site through the potential that the shattered ego offers you to what? See the world in a different way. Your, the, the, in, in, in many of these strands of philosophy, and Levinas particularly, anything that shatters the ego is positive because the ego is a defense mechanism or, uh, uh, um, or a way of not, con not allowing a, a genuine confrontation with the other. And if you, if you limit the discussion to that moment, if you invest that sight, of shattering as the ethical moment, what you're not doing, what you are doing, is leaving out the intersubjective dimension of, um, uh, uh, which is actually the relationship to the other. Because in that moment of being shattered, be that through sh this overwhelming feeling of shame or the overwhelming feeling of tra response to trauma, it is the intersubjective that breaks down. It is the inability then to form relationships that are, to put it, you know, crassly, relationships of equal. Um, 
um, relationships that allow you to both accept yourself and the other. And, and you know, if, if, if we talk about moments of the shattered ego being full of positive, you know, potential, well, actually, people with shattered egos are not in, there is a tendency to, um, to, to invest that moment of absolute abjection and victimhood with, um, uh, to, to valorize it as morally superior or somehow intrinsically moral. Victims are not necessarily any more moral than, than anybody else. It, what, what, makes, what, what is ethical or not is your response to a situation in relation to others. You know, the response to victimhood is often to humiliate others. Uh, and, and, you know, otherwise abuse wouldn't be cyclical. Otherwise, it wouldn't be perpetuated because we, I, I say we, one would come out of a position of victimhood being somehow morally glorious with a halo. It just doesn't work like that. So it seems to me a cop-out to say, oh, here we have this hugely invested ethical moment uh, because it's, it's a theoretical potential. It, it isn't about an engagement in the real world, and that's where you know, I have to have a, have a word for literature and um, li literature and film here. I'm not not that in this context it matters, but if you're speaking with scientists, it does. Um, you know, literature and film care about exploring these moments of of where it gets messy, and and, and this is where I think actually you know literature, film, creative writing. Uh, rather than philosophy, sorry, Akosha, give us, give us the interface between conceptual, <coughs> exploring conceptual ideas and actually the mess that is the world. Does that answer your question, Peter? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I think it's partly a response to what you just said. And actually, it's very refreshing thinking about what, starting with like Matthew Todd, and actually the reality of what you're talking about is people are killing themselves. <laughs> and so this theorizing in quite, you know, in, in an abstract way, and you know, and, and Matthew talks about cultural child abuse, which I always think is a, 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 you know, his phrase, but it's for characterizing that moment when the child is recognized as other and is ostracized, but doesn't see that moment in itself. It, it's too young sort of thing. And then that manifesting itself as shame. But I think, you know, this has been a really nice balance, you know, the, the two of you sort of talking, because actually this in some ways needs to be grounded in the world. This is having a big impact <laughs> on, on people's lives and whether it's um, that sort of uh, the creation of hierarchies within the gay community sort of thing and who ostracizes who or whatever. Um, right the way through to, yeah, what Matthew was talking about, about, you know, um, uh, addiction and things like that. So I think it's always, it's nice to have, yeah, that sort of balance of, okay, but this is what this means. This isn't a, just an abstract thing to be theorised over, but actually this is really affecting people. So thank you for your um, very, uh, you know. Thank you. I, I'd be open. interested to know if anyone had an experience ever of shame and then felt all the better for it afterwards or became super creative or, you know, had, has anyone had a good... That's not usually how the narrative... That's not usually the narrative. The, the narrative is not usually that kind of the experience of shame is kind of like morally edifying. It's kind of, it's, it's the disposition to feel shame because it's meant to suggest a sensitivity to others' opinions, to others' ideas. So it's never like the experience, right? So once you have the experience, you've you've not succeeded in kind of exercising the disposition, it's gone wrong, right? So the experience and the kind of like, the disposition to kind of like, not do things for the shame of it, you know, that's meant to be the thing that's moral, right? That's usually the thing that's honed on is kind of having moral potential. I don't think that's what we're talking about. I think we're talking about the moment of utter and complete humiliation and the, uh, the, the moment, your worst possible moment. I completely, All the yeah. moments that aren't in this yeah. jolly, short story thing that I wrote, all the things you couldn't possibly ever tell anybody, even your psychotherapist. And those are the moments I'm talking about. I just would like to know if anyone has had one of those moments and felt the benefit of it. Okay, well then I think no. <laughs> Don't all shout at once. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are, 
And there are examples of turning around bullying, which is not the same. It's not as serious as I think what you mean, but um, there you can you can turn around bullying, mm. can't you, on the bully? Yes. Can I just in introduce the difference between something that's functional for individuals and something that's functional for groups, <laughs> groups of people? And I, I would say the function of shame isn't to make you feel good about what you've done, it's to make you less likely to do it again in the future for the benefit of a group. Have you ever noticed that in operation? I, th I think possibly that people don't not necessarily do something again, but they make sure other people don't see them doing it again. <laughs> and yes. and the, that it's has a group function. Thing. That has a group function in terms of social norms and what you expect groups of people to do. There's a, there's a concept of evolutionary mismatch where we're biological systems that evolved over millions of years. And the system uh, evolved for conditions that we're not living under now. Our, our sexual desire system is a good example of that, where our system develops where there aren't many sexual triggers in the environment, and now we're absolutely saturated with sexual triggers. And that causes lots of problems for people. And I think shame might not be a million miles away from that in terms of it evolved for very particular environments, but in highly developed cultures like ours, it's triggered in lots of ways that aren't helpful for people anymore. Mm. Rose, may I, may I ask you a question? You just de described your, um, your piece as a jolly piece in a quite <laughs> self-deprecating <laughs> way, because bits of it were not at all jolly, mm. and, and other bits were. You interwove that very interestingly. And, and I've just finished a, a quite a long-term project on trauma and comedy, in fact, in, in literature. So I'm quite interested in, um, in whether you feel that humour more generally, or comedy more generally, however you'd like to understand that, is how that relates to shame, or whether that is something that you might only ever have come to once you're moving out of the very painful location that is shame? Um, I think that if you're, in a, if, you're, if you're talking about shameful subjects and you don't want people to feel sorry for you, which, is, which motivates a lot of people, then if you're funny about it, the idea is that people will laugh along with you rather than feeling sorry for you, and so that it's, it's, it's less dangerous. And I think that, that, that you can use humour to show that you're above, beyond, or beside your subject matter. Whether or not you are in reality is another thing. But you can, you can pretend, or you, and it's the same with, with um, the way that you anecdotalise things. That, and that's what my piece was about really was all how do you tell the stories and how do you make your life and recovery from your childhood how do you how you make that manageable and I think anecdotalizing things turning it into a story that you can stand and also making it into a joke or making being able to be I mean black humor is is a lifesaver in 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 those kind of situations um, and I think it's because if you can get the audience to laugh along with you, it's better than everybody crying or, you know, and I mean, you know, when I, I, I wrote the first version of this before my mum died, and then I had to, when I read it again, I read it after she died, and I had to rewrite part of it, the bit, so that it was obvious that she was dead, whereas in the other one, <laughs> the, the, the earlier version, she was still alive, and that process, um, made me very aware of the humour and, and what to do with it, what to do about it, or how to do without it. And, and if, I, if, I, if I hadn't had any funny bits in it, like my brothers, like a lot of drug addicts, have endless, incredible stories about the, what a laugh it was. And um, if I, I just felt that by including humour in it, I would seem... I wanted to come across as someone that had recovered, and the point being that it would be awful if I came along and said, we, we, we all have these terrible childhoods, 
and you can't get over it. And so I think by being funny, I was, or trying to be funny anyway, I was hoping that I would say loads of shit happens to you, but you, could, you, you know, here I am, I'm still alive, unlike nearly everybody else. In this, I mean. I think there's something really interested in, in that in terms of the relationality to your audience, whether your audience are readers or if you're a performer. And so when you've experienced shame, um, I, sp I'm a, a me I make work around my experience of death um, and trying to um, uh, present that work and go, hi, come and see this, it's really fun. You know, a, a, you know, a bit like when we apologize for the subject matter. Mm. And so my doctorate was a practices research doctorate which looked at shame and performance and that relationship with the audience. And I wonder as a writer whether where you're conscious of that relationship with your audience. And so the humor in some way possibly is about uh, bridging or that, that issue. And I wonder if, it, in, if we think about um, shame and we think of it as, a, we know it as an affect, um, one of the things is the return to acceptance so that when um, you've experienced shame, so for me when my mum and dad died in the same year as when I was a kid, and I felt like a pariah, mm. because every time I would say it to people, they would freak out. So you would go, oh, it's all right, it's all right, it's mm. all right. So you understand that your story upsets people. Mm. So from that point on, you understand the only way that you can be accepted back amongst these people is to not share that story in the way that the, you experience that story. So there's a disjunct between experience and expression. Mm. And I'm wondering if that happens as a writer in the same way for you. Um, I think that when I was writing this, I was <coughs> conscious that I'd be doing something that I don't normally do, which is have an audience, and that I would, that I would actually have to be myself reading it and, in a way, performing it. And when I'm normally writing, I'm writing something which is may, may or may not be published, may or may not be fin ever work, may or may, may or may not fall apart before I get anywhere near the end of it. So that when I'm writing something like that, I'm, it's a much more, um, it's not out in the open air in the same way, it's it, until the last minute it's me and it and that's it and no one else sees it or hears it. But when I was doing this, I was very conscious, um, not, knowing, not knowing what the level of hostility would be towards me, for example, as, um, as a recovered person, as someone who may not have so many obvious difficulties in my present day. I had no idea whether people would be saying, you know, what right have you got to have an opinion or... It, and, and the thing about the rape, that, that, that wasn't in the previous version because I thought, I didn't realize it was a rape and then it's only, I only realized it was a rape since my mum died. And then I started thinking, I could put that in. And then I thought, you're gonna stand up, nobody knows this has happened, and you're gonna stand up in a room, or sit down, <laughs> in my case, in a room full of people who don't know you, and then talk about when you've got, why would you do that, what's your motive? And so while I was writing it, I was thinking to myself, what is my motive? Why am I doing this? Why, I'm shaming myself. Why would you stand up in front of a lot of people and say all the shameful things? And actually, when I wrote it, I went out, I took out some of the most shameful things because they were too shameful and I didn't have the bottle to do it. And then I thought that's in a way my subject matter <coughs> is the things that I'm not going to tell you or, or, or my psychoanalyst or anybody. And, um, and that seemed, sorry, I'm not even answering the question, I'm just ranting on now. But it just, it, so, so I felt very conscious of who I was going to be, whereas when you're writing a novel, you don't have to be anybody. You're, 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 you've, you're the 
the teacher sitting there paring his fingernails and the, the book's gone out into the world with a bit of luck on its own. I thought on, I was showing off, and I think that that's quite a shameful thing to do with, from a family where that wasn't very encouraged. But, yeah, so I think I was, I think it was a, there was a shameful aspect in the showing off of it. I, the, the rape thing, I felt, I don't have shame about that, that I, I don't feel implicated in it, and I don't mind about, now I feel okay. My daughter, I've got a daughter, she wanted to come to this, and I didn't let her come because I didn't want her to hear about this. Um, yeah, so um, I don't know what, I don't think I do feel, I don't think I do feel shame about doing what I'm doing, but I, was cer I certainly felt quite shaky about it, I, and I had to really ask myself why, and the reason I thought about it was when, when I was younger, if somebody had stood up and said, all this happens, but you can recover and get over it and you can make a lot of stories up about it or even be funny about it. I would have felt, found that extremely encouraging. And obviously that whole Me Too thing and all the stuff that's been all over the place, that if you've got a lot of secrets about sex abuse in the past, now's the, now's the time to ask yourself why, you're, why you have to keep quiet about it. I just want to... Um come back because it sort of threw a few light bulbs up for me about this idea of shame as affect, that there are these locations in our lives or in time that um, bring the context, uh, bring a context that um, shape the form of shame um, rather than this kind of idea that it's somehow some kind of deeply human thing that is felt at a pre-feeling state of affect. Because I think, for me, there's a complication there with placing it on one side only or on the other. And I wonder whether the, the lack of... Well, the, the other thing that you brought up about um, whether or not shame kind of spawns um, periods of creativity. I wasn't sure whether you meant the act of shaming or the experience of being shamed. Um, because I think certainly for women in a misogynist society, the way that we live, we go through that construction of our identity and constant shaming, which is you know, absorbed. And I wonder whether this, what I would call a kind of refusal for absorption, which is a kind of regrouping, I think, in my head of a kind of shattered self, which is not something that happens once, but is constantly lived by those people who are othered within, a, within any society for, in, across many divides. I wonder whether that's actually something that we as artists and creative people you know, that is something. I mean, certainly for me as a child, I became aware that I was an artist through those moments. It was those moments of being shamed and a kind of removing myself from that place in order to look at it and not take responsibility for those things as um, uh, something that I had done. Um, that as I grew up, I became much more aware that perhaps that was something to do with my own creativity and I don't really use the word resilience because I, I don't like it much I think it's splattered with all sorts of hideousness um, I had other things but I'll, I'll, I'll shut up yeah. oh you I thought this was for you sorry was it was this for oh this was this was for idols well sh shall I I can't really speak to the cre to the creative aspect uh so much, uh, if at all, but in, in um, the relationship of affect to historical contingency and construction, I think my problem with um, historians and historians of emotion is that they do not, they do, uh, uh, on the one hand, 
and with um, affect theory and um, psychoanalysis, on, actually some bits of psychoanalysis, other bits of psychoanalysis are extremely complex and sophisticated and interesting on the interaction of affect and uh, society and language. But my problem with um, saying that it's shame is always historically contingent because it's historically constructed and it is a social emotion, it's not just a pre-social given, is that it doesn't, um, it doesn't recognize the profundity of that emotion as intrinsic to social interaction and our position as social beings. Um, and and I, I, I think there is something that does go beyond just his, his social construction. I'm not a social constructivist and I'm not a discourse theorist because I think in the end it's not sophisticated enough a model for things like desire and the relationship of shame to desire. And these, uh, you know, it is not adequate to say that desire is constructed. It's, it's more complicated than, than, than that. Um, but I, I don't quite know whether that's what you wanted to hear. I wasn't sure, but, but that was just um, why I think it's t too limited. But Rose, you may want to say a bit more about the, the creativity. Um, just that, that if you have to make up stories about your life to, to, to make it, to, make, to communicate with other people or to make it bearable for yourself, then that presumably is something that you're talking about that you're doing as a child that um, if you're a child and your life you're getting shamed and your life is very difficult then you might stay in your bedroom and read a book and start writing a story and invent yourself and invent a different life for yourself and I suppose in that way if that's what being an artist is I don't know this, that, there, that um, I wouldn't feel that that, that that's not the only way of doing it. There's lots of other ways of doing it, but certainly I don't think there's anyone who doesn't have that shame as a child. So I don't think that um, you don't have to be sexually abused and raped and have violence in your family to have very deep feelings of shame as a child. I think that can come from the, the ordinary things like your parents, there being two of your parents on a good day and they're looking, both looking down at you and you're very small. That in itself could feel shame and, and that might not lead you to writing a story. On that note, I'm afraid we've got to uh, draw this section to a close because uh, otherwise it will overrun. Um, there is refreshment. Oh, no, there is.